screen. Okay, good. Um, I'll be giving you an overview of what you'll be doing as an insect survey technician. Um, you will learn more about more in more detail about each of the topics that I'll be discussing at onboarding and then also at your assigned field office. One of the most important aspects of your job is that you'll need to stay organized. Um, you have lots and lots of supplies to keep track of and keep organized so that you can find what you need quickly. Um, you also should plan out a daily schedule, like where you're gonna place traps that day. And you might have something, for example, like a you know vehicle, and, um, like a oil change or something that day. So you'll have to make sure that you know, each day you kind of plan out before you go out. Um, you also need to keep track of your uh, trap placement deadlines and staff meetings. Um, the trap placement deadlines, you also want to kind of plan for those by looking at the total number of traps you're going to have to put out during the season and then see how many you have to put out per day in order to meet that deadline. And you also have regular staff meetings during the season. They might be virtual or they might be in person. Um, you also want to think about your routes when you plan out your, you know, your work for the season. Um, you want to think about, you know, when you're placing them, checking them, and removing them. You know, you don't want to scatter them all over the place. You want to have some kind of a, a plan ahead before you go out there and, and start trapping. Um, you'll have lots of paperwork to keep track of. You're going to have trap cards, log sheets, and other forms. You might even have mileage to you know to keep track of separate um, than your regular form and you also might have receipts that you're going to have to keep track of um, you also have a lot of passwords to keep track of you'll have an oda password apple password workday i learn maybe gis and maybe more your main focus this season is to help us detect invasive target pests that may have been introduced into the state. And in order to detect those pests, you're going to have to put out insect traps. That's the best way. I mean, sometimes we have visual surveys too, but the vast majority of our surveys, we use insect traps. And most of the traps you're going to be placing are gypsy moth traps. That's this <clears throat> trap over here in the upper left-hand corner. We just call them gypsy moth traps in general, but they're going to be either an Asian gypsy moth trap or a European gypsy moth trap. And it sort of depends on the funding and the location, whether it's an AGM or an EGM. And it'll be marked on your maps. If you have any questions, you can ask your coordinator about it. But it should be, everything should be very clearly marked. Uh, most of you will also put out at least a few Japanese beetle traps. Some of you probably put lots of Japanese beetle traps out. And some of these traps will also have an additional lure, an oriental beetle lure that will be piggybacked onto that trap. And we have a few, we've got one delimitation. Well, I'll explain what that is later. But we'll have, we, some, there's only one or two of you that will be putting out light brown apple moth traps probably this season. In the past, we've put them out statewide, but we have less this year. And then there's some special surveys too. And probably most of you will not be involved with these special surveys, but I just gave a few examples over here on the right of a wing trap, a bucket trap, and a funnel trap. And those are some of the common ones we also use besides the ones here on the left. You will be placing traps at different densities depending on whether a target was caught in your territory. Um, if no targets have been caught in the last two to three years, then the traps will be placed at detection densities, and that's about one to four traps per square mile. And there's an example here in the picture of a detection density over here on the left side of the map. If a target was caught during the last you know, previous two seasons, then you would call it a delimitation density. And that's what you see here inside the circle in this map. And those are usually 49 per square mile and 25 per square mile and 16 per square mile. But sometimes 
there'll be different densities depending on the species and how many years we've been putting out detection traps. Usually we put out detection traps for two years, sometimes three years, and that, that's normally what we do. There can be exceptions, so. Now, if you catch a target insect um, the same season that um, you have, you know, like let's say like, like this year, let's say you caught a gypsy moth in your trap, and then your coordinator says, can you put out some more traps right away? Because let's say we still have time to put out more traps because it's not too late in the season. Then we would call those add-on traps. So we just have to be careful that you don't call any trap that you add on to the, in the season is not an add-on trap. It's only the ones that are related to a trap catch. So um, these three categories are really important when you're entering data during the season. You wanna make sure that you pay close attention to this and that you mark them correctly. Generally, the delimitation or add-on traps will have a, a little black dot in the center of this symbol. So you'll know just by looking at the symbol that it's what type of trap it will be. Most of you will receive a work assignment. Um, the main work assignment we usually pass out is the one here on the right. And it's more detailed and it lists all of the maps and counties that you would be responsible for. It has the numbers of traps on each of those maps over on the right side. And in this example, you don't see the last page, but it was a multi-page assignment. So at the very end, it will tell you the total number that you'd be responsible for. Over here on the left, this type of report is mostly used just to help you gather your supplies together. And it's optional, so you may not receive that, but that would help you you know, know how many like gypsy moth traps you need to, how many bags you need to get from your field office, um, or you know how many lures or supplies. That just helps you kind of organize and figure out what you're going to need. You will receive or may have already received paper maps that are listed on your work assignment. This is an example of one of the maps from the Portland field office. If you look closely, you can see um, these little markers that are on the map. They're little red dots, or they might be squares. They could be dots or squares. Um, and those indicate the approximate site of where you place it, the trap. And it also tells you what type of trap it is. Now it's difficult to see the legend. So I have an example here of um, two legends from one from the Southwest Oregon field office and then one from the Portland field office map. Now these symbols are gonna be the same whether you're looking at a hard copy or if you're looking at the electronic maps. And we try to be consistent throughout the whole state so that if for some reason you had to help out in another field office, the symbols should look the same on their maps too. In addition to your paper maps, you also have electronic maps available. You should find this list of maps in your books on your iPhone. If you can't find that list or you can't find any other documents, let your survey coordinator know. They should have been pre-installed when you got your phone. And this document that list of maps is a is a there's a little picture here in the left hand corner of this of the screen, and those are actually live links in there, and those work for the for the web. But um, you have to enter a little differently um, through one of the applications, and I can tell you that when we get there. I wanted to give you a brief description of how. The electronic maps are set up and why it's important for you to sync every day. And what I mean by sync is that you guys will have, you have an electronic database on your iPhone called Trap Manager Database, and you'll be collecting your data in there. And every day you're gonna be syncing that data and it's gonna get updated. Unfortunately, not automatically. I have to do it manually. So it'll happen a couple times a week and it will get put on this um, online map. And this online map, you can view either through a web mapping application, you can through, go through your web browser, 
or you can go through um, one of the applications that's on your phone. Some of you that are returning for this season will probably remember the Explorer app and maybe you used it a lot. Um, at, the, <clears throat> at the end of this season, um, the Explorer app is going to be retiring and Field Maps is going to be replacing it. I know that Collector is also being replaced and only um, some techs may be familiar with Collector. But as far as I can tell, it looks identical. So I don't think you're going to have any trouble switching to field maps from Explorer, and you're welcome to use either one this season. <clears throat> These apps allow you to view and navigate to your planned and placed traps, and also view the status of your removed traps at the end of the season. Now, this is the part where I'd mentioned that there's no, you, you can't just click on a link to open this map in one of these apps. So that document that is in your books, there's the, the name of each of these maps is listed in there. So when you open this app, you'll be um, having to type in the name, the title of the map, and then it should find it. And it's also public, so you don't need to log in. So you can just ignore the login step when you first open these. Now in Trapman, you will have a little symbol here, looks like a world symbol. And um, th this may look totally unfamiliar to, to some of you that are totally new, but don't worry about it too much. We, just, we can just focus on one little part at a time. Um, this little world button, if you click on that, then you'll get this pop-up and it will go right to that site where you had placed the trap, although, Right when you start trapping, and you, if you hit that button, you won't see anything because first you have to place the trap at the site, and then I have to you have to sync your phone, and then I'll have to update the map online. So there's a couple of steps. So as you go through the season, I'll be updating them a couple of times a week. So don't worry if if you click on it and it just goes to an entire map and it doesn't pop up your site. That's just because it, ha it hasn't gone through all those steps yet. You can also open this um, online, um, and if you wanted to search for a site number, you could just put it in this box, and you could search for any site that we place during the season, which is helpful sometimes. And I think our office staff also likes to use it if they get a phone call and want to see where the trap's located and who it belongs to, and sometimes that helps them too. Now, after traps have been assigned to you, you're gonna to need to find places to set the traps. There are many different types of sites where you'd be placing traps. It also depends on your territory. You could be placing traps on the edge of a forest or you might be in an area where there's almost no trees at all. Now, what you should try to do is place the traps in secure locations with good hosts. Um, examples of these have been mentioned earlier um, on, as far as like um, right-of-ways and parks and highway pullouts um, and private property is also a great spot as long as you have consent. And you've already heard in a lot more detail about right-of-ways and um, private property and contacting the homeowners. There are certain places you like you should avoid though, because the the traps um, are often you know removed and vandalized. So you want to avoid schools, um, like really busy locations, like busy street corners, construction sites, houses that are for sale, um, roadsides where the brush is removed. It's still okay to put those. I know you guys talked about it a little bit already about putting um, traps still on roadsides. And if you keep the traps like up against a telephone pole or, you know, a place that's not going to be mowed over, um, it, you know, that, that helps a lot in keeping them safe. 
I think Chantel may have mentioned too, you want to put, if it's a gypsy moth trap, you want to put it on the back side of the tree so you can't see it as you drive by as easily. Now I'll show you some examples of traps that had been placed in the past. Um, some are pretty good, some not so good, but I think we can learn from something from each of these images. This first one here on the left um, is a gypsy moth trap right here and a Japanese beetle trap. And these traps are really too close. They should be much farther apart. Um, you know, we can't really know the whole situation. This could have been a really low host area and maybe the person had a really hard time finding a spot. So if it wasn't that kind of situation where they had a really hard time finding a spot, I say, yeah, that's fine. You know, you could put them there, but you might want to to move the Japanese beetle trap a little farther away. Over here on the right, we have a gypsy moth trap in green and then a light brown apple moth trap here on the right in red. Now, the gypsy moth trap is up against the trunk, so you, that's not good to put the end of the trap where the moth enters in the trap. You know, now it only has one side to enter. There's also a lot of um, branches around the trap, making it hard for the moth to enter. And this light brown apple moth trap has the insert hanging out. <laughs> Looks like it wasn't, it was just thrown up there without any care at all. <clears throat> and it's also extremely close to the gypsy moth trap. Um, this is also not a very good host for either of these species. So you know, if that's if it, if it's your last resort, you know, you could put one in. You could put maybe the gypsy moth trap in this tree and put the elbam across the street if you had to. And so you you probably want to find a deciduous tree, which would have been a little bit better choice. Over here on the left, we have a gypsy moth trap dangling from the end of a limb. And it's probably just going to bowl around and fall on the ground. Um, the other issue is the gypsy moths like to, they're, they're attracted to the main trunks of trees. So this is not an ideal placement. And um, you, there are trees around you can see in the background of the picture. So this person should have, you know, found a tree with a big main trunk and put that trap up against the trunk. Over here on the right, this trap isn't terribly bad how they placed it. We can also see in the background that um, there's some deciduous trees in the background. So they pro this trap probably could have been put in a better tree and could have also been placed a little bit better if you put it up against the main trunk. But you never know. You don't know the whole situation. Um, why they would have put the trap here, but just by looking at the picture, you think, oh, they probably could have done, you know, put it in a different tree and done a little bit better job here. <clears throat> now this trap on the left, this looked like it was placed really well. It's in a deciduous tree, it's up against the trunk, and looks like um, Barry's inspecting the trap here at the time. Now, it doesn't look like an oak tree. That would be the ideal host. I thought I should just mention that. Um, but this is totally fine how this trap's placed and the host that was used. <clears throat> it's like it's a maple tree, I think. Over here on the right, this Japanese beetle trap looks like it was placed really well. It's out in the sun. It, it doesn't have um, lots of stuff in the way, so it has lots of good airflow and has a looks like a well-irrigated lawn. Um, I can't tell from the photo. It's hard for me to see what plant is back here. At first I thought maybe it was blackberries, but maybe not. Um, but the most ideal sites for Japanese beetles would have a really well watered lawn or turf and an additional host like a fruit tree or roses or grapes or something like that. But you can't always get both you know, at every site. So you're going to have to just do, do the best you can, either choose really good turf or you're going to find grapes or you're going to find roses. Um, but if you can find both, that's excellent. Mm -hmm. 
As you place your traps, you'll be numbering the traps and the sites where you place them. Um, you're going to be given barcode stickers, and the barcode stickers are what we use for the trap numbers. Um, there's no need to try to organize them or figure out which one to pick next. You just take the next one on the roll and you use that one. Fortunately, you don't have to do too much of that because the barcodes have already been placed on the gypsy moth traps ahead of time. So the only traps you're going to have to worry about are the Japanese beetle traps, the LBAM traps, and if you're involved with special surveys, then you have to put them on those too. Here's an example here on the upper right corner of the slide. Um, this is example site number 19123. And this particular site has two barcodes because it has two traps. And also at this site, here's an example of what you would get, how you'd fill out a um, little tag for a sample cup, like for um, Japanese beetles. If you thought you caught some and you put it in the cup, you'd fill out the little uh, tag and put the information on that tag, which matches your site. So every trap will have a barcode number, and every site will have um, a site number. And that site number is generated by your um, electronic database, the trap manager database that's on your phone. So you just have to make sure that if you delete something on your phone, um, you know, you might that'll make you skip a number, so you'll have to reset the numbers. But generally, the, the numbers are created for you. There's nothing you need to do. It just keeps track for you. And, and when you set another trap, it gives you the next number. And this will all be based on your number series. You guys will all be assigned a number series for your territory. Um, as you work, you'll be recording trapping data in multiple places. You'll be recording it on the trap card in the trap manager database, on the log sheet, on the trap itself. And if you happen to have sample cups, you would put that information on the um, little tag that goes with the sample cup. Now, when you're entering this information, please be very careful about you know, the data that you're collecting. It might just take you another minute to be really, to make sure that you're putting things down correctly. But just keep in mind that um, one little mistake you, met, you made because you're trying to work fast can cause us many hours of work later on at the end of the season to fix it. So it'd be, it's just extremely helpful if you guys could just make sure you don't go too fast, don't rush, and make sure that you're recording things correctly. I should also say it's less work for you too, because we usually make you go through and review towards the end of the season to make sure all of your data is correct. I'm going to just say, Carrie, that's such great advice. Everybody, please make note as you're doing that. Each site is really important to do it correctly as you go and fix those mistakes rather than look for them later. Here's some examples. I'm going to show you examples of some of the forms you're going to be filling out. Um, here is um, a trap card that's been filled out. You're going to put in the county and the, the site number. And this is that site number I mentioned that'll be generated through your um, electronic database. So basically, this trap card is very similar to what goes in your database on your phone. You know, they look quite a bit different, but the information is the same. <clears throat> um, and then you have your map name, and you find that on your map, and the map number as well. And then the location will be the lat long and decimal degrees, and you'll get that through your phone. Um, and then you could put down an address here. If you don't have an exact address, you can put, um, like if it's a corner, you can put the corner of the street and that street. You know, the, most accurate description you can put there if you don't have an address. And this is one thing that's not very intuitive. It says comments, and we want you to put the barcode numbers there. Um, later on, we will be updating the card so that it says barcode numbers instead of comments. 
and then you'll just have to put comments wherever you can fit them. And here's a site diagram. Generally, generally we like you to have the house color on there. This is only if it's a house. Like in, this is kind of an example, like in a neighborhood. So you would put the house color and the house number, and then the street that it's on, and the closest cross street, so you could find it pretty easily on a map. And then we would put like a little X or a dot where the traps are placed in the yard, along with the host. And then down at the bottom here is where you keep track of the service dates and the placement dates and the removal dates. And the activity codes, you, see, you can just find them right over here on the card. And those are what you'll find in the electronic database also. And this little corner is for the consent and you just check the consent, um, whatever applies. If you have verbal, you can check verbal um, prearranged. And I don't think you're going to probably have administrative warrants, so it's mostly going to be these two you're going to worry about. If you want to put any comments here, um, you know, that someone might need to know, like, just you pretend like you may not be the one going back to check the trap. So you have to make sure the trap card's filled out really well with any notes that someone might, might need to know. They might have animals that you need to be careful of, or a gate you need to, need to worry about, or a place you're not supposed to park. Um, that's that's what this comment box was originally made for. So if you run out of room here and don't have room here, you can just write notes here on the site diagram also. Here's an example of a log sheet. So you'll fill out a chunk of this log sheet every day. It has the days of the week down the side, and you'll put in the start and stop time for the day, the amount of time you took for your lunch time, whether it's a half an hour or an hour, um, beginning and ending miles, and then the total number of hours worked. And if you have any sick leave or vacation, make sure you keep track of that too on your log sheet so we have it down in writing. Um, over here in this part of this um, area on the log sheet, you'll put down it's a little bit small to see, but the P here is for placed. So it shows that this person placed 25 gypsy moth traps. And then this is their territory or their number series. So if the territory was number, if you had number series 24,000, you'd have territory 24. And then the map number you get off the map. And then sometimes, you know, often you're sending setting multiple traps during the day, you know, so you'll have to split it out. Um, to for the mileage and the hours. So most of you will probably be setting mostly gypsy moth traps. And this one, this log sheet's actually not quite correct because so it should put, it should say EGM or AGM on here, but it doesn't, um, but it does have AGM. So this really should have been EGM. Um, so then you would just split out the, um, all your time and mileage and then you keep going day after day, recording those things until you get to the bottom. And then you'll put in your, at the end of the week, you put in your total hours you worked, your total miles that you drove, and then you'll add up all of your trap totals and your mileage totals. And then your grand total is set to date down here. So it will give you an idea of you know, how many you've placed so far as you go along. And then your, your survey coordinator will let you know when and how you should turn in your log sheets. So you may do it at staff meetings or your coordinator may want you to mail them in. So just make sure you're clear with your coordinator, you know, what, how it is that you should be turning these in. And these do tear off and then there's a bottom sheet that you can keep for your record. So it's the top sheet that you'll be mailing in to your coordinator or handing them. I took a few screenshots of the Trap Manager database, the electronic database that's on your iPhone where you're going to be entering your trapping information. When you first open it, um, you're going to see this main menu right here. And um, if you want to set a trap, that's the first button at the top. And it, I skipped some of the steps. You can't, it's really hard to just tell how this works without really seeing it yourself. And, or live, 
So there's a few sk steps skipped here, but basically you hit set trap and it guides you through setting a trap. And then you put in all the information about that site. You can add as many traps as you want to that site if they're all together at that same address or same farm or you know same location. And then when you go back to check a trap, it will guide you just, you can hit this button on the home screen, it will guide you through. Um, there are multiple ways to use Trapman. So if you wanna check a trap, you don't necessarily have to go here and just hit check trap. You, there's all these different ways you can, you can check a trap. You can go here to your site list and you can view these. You can go in here to edit something if you think you put something in incorrectly. Um, it just kind of goes around and around in Troutman going, you know, from your site list to um, you can go to your your traps at those sites. Um, it's, it's really hard to explain, but I thought I should give you at least a brief overview here just to have something to picture in your head um, what you're going to be doing when you record electronic data. Um, the more button here gives you some other options. Sometimes you use relocate sites and that you don't use that very often, but on an occasional basis, someone might want you to move all the traps at one site to another site because the homeowner decided, I don't want these traps there. So you can use that button. It will help you relocate everything without having to re-enter all the information. It'll just move it over to a new site and you enter that. Now this preferences button, you're gonna use that a lot. You're probably gonna go in and out of preferences um, because you can control what Trapman does through your preferences. Um, there's many reports for you to use. Um, they're kind of self-explanatory and I would just go ahead, you, you're totally fine if you go in there after you set a few traps to run these and see how they work. Um, you won't hurt anything. It's just a report. So probably if you, I would recommend earlier in the season, take a look at that, see how they work. And your coordinators might be able to give you, you know, more information on how they want you to use these. If they need some information from you, you might be able to get that to them easier by using these reports. Um, there's also the sync button, and we'll talk a little bit about more about that in a few minutes. I'm going to continue on with a little bit more information about Trapman because there's a few things in there that are just not as intuitive and might be a little confusing if you haven't used it in the past. Um, one of those things is recording your lat long. So let's say you just set a trap and it's asking you to fill out the site information. And one of those things is you want to record your lat long. So I can tell you how I'd recommend that you would record your lot long. Um, the satellite button is where I would start. When you hit that satellite button, you're going to get this pop-up. And this pop-up is to kind of guide you to get an accurate lat long. So if you were just to hit this button and say, yes, I've refreshed, we shouldn't say that because it might take the lat long in the phone's memory from the last site you were at, and now you're gonna end up with the wrong lat long. So generally you, you wanna hit this one that says no, refresh. It also is a little bit darker in color, so that's usually the one you want to hit is the one that's darker in the selection. So you wanna hit no, refresh, and when you hit that, it'll take you to Google Maps or Apple Maps, whatever you've chosen in your preferences, and then you're gonna watch the little blue dot and wait until that blue dot settles down and looks like it's in the right spot. Like if that's where you're standing where the blue dot is showing on the map, then you know it's a pretty good accurate location. So once you have that, you hit this back button here, back to FileMaker Go, and then you hit the but this button again, and now you can say, yes, you have refreshed. And then it will put in your lat long and it should so show you a low accuracy number. So the lower the number, the better. You want it to be, you know, five, 10 is good. If you get like 50 or higher, you probably should um, try it again. It's probably not showing your location very accurately. Now, the reason I have these little, these devices over here on the left 
the dual, I don't know if anyone's going to use the dual, but if you have really poor cell reception and you're getting really poor readings, um, if you connect this Bluetooth GPS to your phone, it will automatically grab that lat long from that rather than the iPhone. Um, you can also, if you're out in a remote area and you just don't think you can get very good lat longs, um, you can use a handheld device. You can type it in too. We don't recommend that you type it in, but you can if, if you need to. And then after you've recorded your lat long, if you needed to go back and check it, um, if you hit this button, this pin, it, it's, um, it'll show you where your lat long is and whether you think it look, you can see if it looks correct. Um, if you hit this button again later on, after you recorded it, it'll ask you if you want to replace it. And, you know, you could replace it if you think it's wrong. That's totally fine. But if you just want to look at it and see, you know, where it's marked it, you can just check that. So when you're on your the main menu of the Trapman database, there's a button here that says Sync. and what this button does is it'll update the, the tables on your phone, like the host, the species. We don't generally make changes to it, but sometimes we discover that there was an error, we missed something, we missed a host, we missed a missed a um, alert or something. Um, we will add it. So anytime you sync, that will be updated on your phone. And then all of the text data will be sent to your phone when you sync. So you Often you're just going to be looking at your own data, but sometimes you need to see other text data. If you've been asked to check their traps or remove their traps, you can easily pick any tech you want to see their data and um, it'll be right there on your phone already. Um, this also sends your data to Salem and it backs it up. So um, this is something that is really important to do is to sync. So the guidelines for syncing is that you want to sync at least once a day. Um, often text will sync um, first thing in the morning and then again at the end of the day. And you only want to attempt to sync when you have a good connection. Um, it's okay to sync just on cell service if you, if you need to. If you've been keeping up every single day syncing, usually that's not a problem. If you wait like three weeks and try to sync on cell service you may not have good luck and then unfortunately it gets worse and worse as time goes on that you delay it so you really want to keep up with this sync every single day at least once um, you can connect to the vpn i have a screenshot over here on the right it's in your iphone settings and it says um you'll see the vpn right there towards the top of the settings and um, it's not required that you connect to the VPN, but if you do, you can. it might even take a little bit longer, but it's supposed to be less likely that it will drop. So if you're having some trouble connecting, um, you know, it's totally worth a try if you want to connect to it. Sometimes I actually forget to connect to it and I haven't had trouble. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just I want you to know it's there if you want to use it. <clears throat> And if a sync fails, keep trying until you're successful. Every once in a while, you do get a different message. So if the message looks like something that no matter how, like if you think, well, no matter how many times I sync, you know, I can't get past this. You know, if it says the database is closed or, you know, some kind of different message, you probably want to ask your survey coordinator. But sometimes if it just says that your connection was, you know, you um, couldn't connect, with, you couldn't communicate with the server, Often that could be just that you didn't have a good connection at the time. You might, might want to move across the room or, you know, if you're outside, you want to move, um, you know, even just moving half a block will help sometimes. But just make sure it's really important you, that you sync at least once a day. And if you can't, contact your survey coordinator and we can try to figure something out for you if you're having a lot of trouble. Here's some advice that I have for you. We've had techs corrupt their data files before. So the Trapman database um, used to be more delicate than it is now. We've seen a lot less corrupted files than we have in the past. But I recommend that when you're done for the day, that or even maybe during the lunch hour, 
you close trap men. Um, when I say close, you use this close button here from the main menu. Um, and it's okay to use the file, leave the file maker go open during the day. Um, but at the end of the day, I totally recommend you first you close this and then you close file maker go. And you don't want to close the files too quickly, especially you don't want to just sync and close. You could, you could, if you go too fast, you could corrupt your data file because it's probably still processing in the background. So you don't want to move too fast. I've also had techs corrupt their files by um, syncing, closing, and shutting off their phones so fast that it, you know, wasn't finished processing and it, and it would corrupt the files. So always make sure everything is closed at the end of the day when you're all done, especially when you're restarting your phones. I thought it might be helpful to give you an example of what a day would be like as a survey technician. Um, if you're experienced, you might have something, you know, slightly different than what I'm showing. And this is just a rough example of what it might be like for in one day while you're working. So in this example, the day begins at home or at your field office. And what you need to do is make sure you gather your supplies, organize everything, and have a plan for the day. And you might even sync trap man if you're at the office or at home would be a good time to do that, especially if you have Wi-Fi. So you want to check your map. You know, the first map that you're going to pull out to, to work on. And um, your coordinator can give you some advice as far as which map you might want to start on. Because we generally start with your higher risk maps or maps that have um, delimitations or even cities first. Usually we do the low risk county maps at the end. So here's an example here. I blew up the map so you can see the site that I've chosen to place the first trap. So you're going to drive to the approximate trap site on the map and you'll start searching for trap sites with good hosts. As soon as you see some, um, you know, good sites, you know, possible sites with good hosts, you want to carefully pull off the road and park, get out of your vehicle, and then you would ask for permission to place the trap at that good site. Now, if it's a site where it's just like a roadside and there's nobody around, of course, you don't have to do this part. Um, there's no one to hand the flyer to, so you would just skip that step. And make sure that when you go to the door, and I think you guys have already heard this, that you make sure you have an example trap or traps with you, like the ones you're gonna be planning to place in that yard, the flyers for those species, um, and you make sure you have your credentials and you might even want to wear your safety vest so they can tell, you know, from looking out the window or, you know, through people in the door that you're actually doing some work and you don't look quite as much like a salesperson or, you know, someone they're not too sure about. So I, I think it's helpful to wear your vest. Then you go back to your vehicle after you get permission and that's where you're going to organize your stuff. Um, you want to get your traps labeled and sometimes you you know some techs will assemble their traps before they go in the field um, so you could have those pre-assembled like everything except maybe the lure um, and you want to make sure everything's labeled really well and then you go ahead and place the traps in or near the, the good host and at this point you want to make sure you complete the trap card the trap man and um, label the hard copy map with the site number. And then when you're all done at that site, you're going to go look at your map again and see what would be the next site that would be the, that would make the most sense to go to next. So you keep doing that, you know, all day long, choosing the next site and the next site um, until you get lots of traps put out on that map. And towards the end of the day, you want to think about how long it's going to take you to drive back home or to your field office, whichever site you're going to. You want to make sure you have enough time to drive back. And you also might need a little, just not a lot of time, but a little bit of time to fill out paperwork at the very end of the day. There won't be a lot of paperwork, 
I mean, it shouldn't be if you're doing things correctly in the field, you know, filling out everything when you're at the site is what you should be doing. Um, but you still might need to fill out your daily log, your work summary, your log sheet, and then you'll still probably need to sync, charge your phone, and you might need to organize your trap cards a little bit too. Well, I just gave you a very brief overview of what you'll be doing this season as a survey technician. Um, I'm sure if you're new, you're going to have lots of additional questions. So um, in addition to um, the onboarding training, um, you, you also have a, some additional resources. I think you've probably already looked in your binders. So I don't know, if, um, there's still, there should be a lot of information that can help you there. And in books, there's quite a few documents in there. You have a um, trap, man, trap Man user manual, and you should have a, um, another book in there too that talks all about trapping and a couple other separate documents that are in there also. And then you also have your survey coordinators to ask questions to. And um, you're gonna, you still have a lot more training ahead. So I know that what I've covered still might be a little confusing and, and don't worry about that. So we'll cover everything I covered in more detail later on. Um, does anybody have any questions? That was a great overview, Carrie. Thank you for that. Yeah, sure. Am I missing any questions in the chat box? I don't see anything, Carrie. I think.